Thanks very much. Um, sorry, Brett, right. and uh, welcome <laughs> to um, uh, tonight. Um, um, my name's Caroline Lee, and I'm a writer and performer. And on behalf of Chambermaid Opera and the Wheeler Centre, I'm delighted to welcome you tonight to our panel discussion on the mysterious art of libretto writing. Joining me, I have two librettists, Joanna Murray-Smith Peter, and Peter Goldsworthy, and the composer, Brett Dean. Um, I, we're very strapped for time this evening. Uh, we've got three really interesting people, and um, Brett has to leave on the dot of 7.15 to go down to um, to a rehearsal of his upcoming work, which we'll be talking about. So if we don't get any questions at the end or only one or two, please forgive us in advance. Joanna and I are happy to stay till midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Especially without a composer here, we can really, yeah. uh, then you can really, uh, really go for it. <laughs> so um, Peter... Um, Peter Goldsworthy uh, grew up in um, various Australian country towns. He finished his schooling in Darwin. And after graduating in medicine from the University of Adelaide, he worked for many years in alcohol and drug rehabilitation. And since then, he's divided his time equally between writing and his general practice. He's won major awards across a range of genres, poetry, short story, the novel, in opera, and most recently in theatre. Um, Peter's novels have sold over 400,000 copies in Australia alone, have been translated into many European and Asian languages. And as it happens today, is a very auspicious day for Peter because it's the official launch date of two of his books. Um, by two different publishers, one new, one old. His 1996 novel, Wish, is being reissued by text in their Australian classic series, and his new book, a comedic memoir, His Stupid Boyhood, mm -hmm. is being published by Penguin. So we're really lucky to have Peter with us tonight. <laughs> Peter's written a couple of uh, librettos for opera. Um, the, well, actually three. Um, two were with Richard Mills working as the composer. That was Summer of the 17th Doll in 1996 and Batavia in 2001. His most recent songwriting collaboration has been with the composer Graham Kerner on the ringtone cycle, a cabaret quintet for piano, trio, soprano and iPhone, <laughs> which premiered last year at the Adelaide Festival and is being produced by Opera Australia in Melbourne during the other ring cycle later this year. So Peter, Peter and I had quite a long conversation down in the moat earlier, so it might feel a little bit like... Um, yeah, that's right, Groundhog Day. But um, shall we start by talking a little bit about Batavia? Sure, yeah. I'd, yeah. Um, so Batavia was your, um, it was an original work. And can we just talk well, about... Richard and I had done, had done um, an adaptation. That was of Son of the 17th Doll. And I, I thought, and after that, which was you know, a fascinating and somewhat humbling experience for me, I think. I learned a lot about the play... Mainly because Ray Lawler had a, a right of veto of every line, and um, you know I went into that bit gung ho and thinking I knew about that play, but I didn't. And um, but also the problem that, from a librettist point of view with that was you're tampering with a sacred text, and you have to reduce a sacred text to maybe one fifth or quarter of its yeah. you know word count. And that's a big, big issue, big, big difficulty. But I enjoyed it, and I did learn. In the, in the end, I learned a lot about the play, and um, I won't comment about the, you know, the, the kind of result. That's for others to judge. But I did love the experience, and we also had Richard Werriton there, uh, at, at kind of directing it, and a dramaturging it a bit too, which was terrific. And um, but then Opera Australia asked us to come up to do something else, and I had a couple of ideas. One was to do Ern Malley, um, which I thought would be you know kind of nice, a bit of musical theatre. The other was Batavia, which is an idea that had been going around in my head for a long time. I thought it was a film. I mean, it's, it's it's the historical events are just so the trajectory is so sort of simple and mythic. And in some ways, coincident, the coincidences are unbelievable. It's, it's just made for movies. But what makes a good movie, I think, 
probably makes a good opera. Mm. Those emotional trajectories, um, which you know we love. Uh, I mean, I'm using in mythics a ten dollar word, but you know, you, you know, I, I kind of mean it in a way in in terms of the story like Batavia. So I had to sell that to Richard a bit, and but eventually he, I'd been trying to get music, you know. Um, uh, like Scott Hicks, for instance, and people like that, um, interested in this idea as a movie, because it seemed made for the movies. But uh, eventually, you know, and Richard came around, and um, and I thought, uh, so we got together, and um, that's how that happened. And uh, but it seemed to me, I read a bit of Dutch poetry at that, that time, you know, the 17th century, early 17th century, late 16th. But you know, the, the ship was launched in 1628, so Shakespeare was. You know, not long dead, and uh, I thought it'd be fun to write a libretto, or fun, but you know, interesting to write it in an archaic English, and whether it was Milton or the Metaphysicals or late Shakespeare, or Tempest, is, you know, it was an obvious thing to sort of grab hold of and maybe you know, imitate, and um, so that's that's what I aim to do. And mm-hmm. how long did it take you to write it? Oh, a year or so. Richard came over to Adelaide for a week and we nutted out, um, you know, basic, you know, blocked out and the narrative and where he thought he could see the sort of the big numbers, if you like. Right. And uh, um, I suppose to look at it for, at that point and I started writing it and I wrote about maybe twice as much as, as was used. I just got carried away with that, <laughs> um, you know, that's, that sort of 17th century stuff and... Um, he, about half of it ended up on the cutting room floor, and that's fair enough. I mean, I'd be interested to hear from Brett on this, but mm-hmm. the music, finally, the musical imperatives. I mean, and music can tell a story, of course, part of the story, and should, I and mean, will. So you have to sort of take second fid- fiddle, I think, in that uh, context as a, as a librettist. Um, I, mean, I think there's only one, you know, Gilbert and Sullivan, it's the only time a, a librettist has had his name, you know, yeah. at the front. But that's because he produced the bloody things, and he could put it wherever he, he paid the money. <laughs> he, could, he could he could do whatever he liked. So you have to take second fiddle at some level. But you know, to to have words set to music, which is you know, where they should be, that's where poetry originally was. And uh, I think you, you're very happy to do that. It's lovely to hear hear your words sung. Do you have any thoughts about that, Brett? Lovely to hear words sung. No, no, the the (laughs) sort of, I guess, which imperative... Is it the music or is it the story? How do do you negotiate those two things? Well, I I can only concur with Peter on on that that aspect of reducing the the story to its bare essentials and, and somehow it needs to retain... The biggest bones that the piece, that the story has, you know, you have to strip it back, and leave space for the the music to to be part of the fleshing out process, mm-hmm. and and the voices themselves. So, yeah, that that is very much, you know, you you have to pair it right back and see what what the essential elements are of of a, a story's narrative and drive. Yeah. When Peter and I were talking earlier, I said to him, so pretty much there's no room for preciousness about your own words as a librettist, which he heartily concurred with. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, yeah, you mean you might go home and swear a bit, but <laughs> you finally have to roll over. I mean, someone has to make the decision and has to be the composer. Yeah, so it was... It was Richard who ended up making the decisions about which parts of your text he would use and which parts were not used. Yeah, I, I sort of tried to have some revenge. There's a, there's a, oh, the Book of Common Prayer was another, um, and I thought there's a, there's a phrase in the Book of Common Prayer I always loved. It's, well, it's just a, the moth of death, and it has those sort of fricatives. And I thought, well, you know, I'll fix him up. And I wrote, I wrote a line that, that, that uh, I said, uh, I think it goes like this. Um, uh, there is, there is no soul, but if there be no, if there is a soul within the body's cloth, the moth of death eats both. <laughs> and I thought, you know, totally singable. S- stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Really, you know. And did it stay in? Yeah. <laughs> so I now think that you know I don't know what Joanna thinks, but that, that singers can sing anything. I didn't think that that would be possible. <laughs> Brett, do you think singers can sing anything? Well, I mean, we um, when I lived in in Berlin, we had a Polish uh, babysitter, 
and uh, an older woman who became a kind of um, surrogate grandmother to our kids who you know were a long way from family and she would also speak to them in Polish. Um, they picked up a, a little bit along the way, but I, I've often thought, my God, that would be a very difficult language <laughs> to set in because people often talk of English being difficult to sing and so on, but Szymanowski didn't have a problem. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I think where there's a will to express, there are all sorts of ways that, that an opera singer or a, a singer of any kind can get around... You know, there are there's song in every language, really, yeah. and and I think one can over overplay that it's got to be an Italian sort of thing. Of course, one can sing just about anything. Uh, you know, even ths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so on a microcosmic level, you didn't find that there was much fiddling around with the within lines as an adjustment. Or did that oh, the happen? composers always send stuff back to you for. Um, but I, I mean, it's guess it's, it's like it, it, theatre, or um, which you know, Joan has a lot more experience than I do. But I've worked a bit in theatre and, and movies that you just it just has to be collaborative finally, and you have to uh, learn to step back when necessary. I mean, that's a good a good fight is useful and creative often. You know, good stand up. Uh, but but um, generally you'll be the one that steps back, especially with Richard. Um, <laughs> we won't go there, I think, into the <laughs> recent developments. And so, Joanna, you, um, you wrote the libretto to Love in the Age of Therapy, which was composed by Paul Grabowski. Was that... Did, is your experience similar to Peter's? Yeah, I mean, I think it was hard, a hard experience to begin with for a playwright. Um, perhaps it's the hardest transition uh, to go from being a playwright to being a librettist because as a playwright you are the most important person in the room or you, you think you are or you're allowed to believe that for quite a big part of the process. Um, and, uh, you know, technically you're not... Uh, you're, Actors and a director are not allowed to change a word of your script um, without consulting you um, and generally will defer uh, if you um, defend, you know, strongly enough. Whereas, uh, and of course, you, you know, you say, well, the play will live or die by the script in the end. Um, even a great cast can't save a bad play, um, probably. But with opera, it was really totally different because I was, um, you know, really... I, I, it was very humbling. I had to... I realised that the work was going to live or die by the music. Um, the libretto could make it all much better uh, or, you know, make it much worse. But ultimately, if the, if the finished product was going to be memorable um, and if it, you know, it would please its audience and if it would stay in the memory and, and go on and have another life, it was going to do so on the basis of the music. Um, so I had to do everything I could to help Paul um, and that meant sometimes curtailing my own creative flourishes. Um, and, uh, you know, he was, I think, now looking back, too deferential to me, um, which was possibly the problem of creating something with a friend um, right. because we loved each other and he didn't want to um, hurt my feelings or, you know, <laughs> perhaps in danger of a friendship. Um, but I think the libretto, my libretto was uh, too long and was overwritten and didn't give him enough space. I mean, it worked and audiences seemed to enjoy it. But um, going into the second one now, I am much more conscious of the fact that, yes, character is important. Yes, wit, I think, is important um, because this is a, a largely comic opera. Um, but uh, but ultimately, uh, the emotional weight of the piece and the and the emotional weight of anything for me is what makes something interesting um, and charismatic. Um, is really all about the music, and I'm going to have to just um, you know accept that. So just to fill everyone in, Joanna is at the moment working with Eleanor Katz-Chernan um, on a new work called The Divorce. 
and um, it was commissioned. Is it commissioned by Australian Opera? It was. It was commissioned by Opera Australia originally as a contemporary, a new contemporary opera to be performed on stage. Um, after I and uh, Lyndon came to me and said we'd like you to write a libretto. So that's sort of unusual, and that the libretto was the first thing that was was the starting point. And he said, "What? Who would you like to work with?" And um, uh, I said, who would you like to do it? And he said, well, we're very interested in Elena. And uh, I was very happy about that, so I, I said, great. And um, But then after I wrote the first draft of the libretto and had actually sent it to Elena, and she had begun to sort of conceive of it musically, um, and we had a couple of sessions together where she just sat there with the piano and played kind of the tone of what she was sort of in the moment she would just sit there quite brilliantly and just sort of take off and say what do you think about this as a kind of sound for the opera um, after that the opera came back to me and said we've had this uh, rather audacious and but kind of interesting idea of instead of doing it as a live opera doing it as a four or five part uh, television series opera so that it would be 20 to 30 minutes um, every night for four or five nights, the same piece of music, um, but divided up with, you know, cliffhangers at the end of each one and recaps at the beginning of each episode. So I then had to go back and do a new draft of it, um, altering it so that it would work as, as for, well, at the moment, four complete distinct episodes that would all kind of work together as a whole. That must have been a substantial difference, though. I mean, did you have that sense of cliffhangers already in the original? There was shape, a little or? bit because I mean, the, the story of the divorce is really just—it's uh, it all takes place during one uh, party. Um, so all four or five nights of the opera are taking place in the same space within the same two-hour time, three three-hour mm. time frame. Um, so there's not, there weren't a lot of sort of shenanigans to do with changing scenes mm. and time jumps and all of that. It's quite, it was all real time. It's a great idea, isn't mm. it? Can the music be left cliffhanging harmonically or something? Too? Possibly, you know, yeah. I'm just interested. Yeah. I mean, suddenly it opens yeah. up a whole lot of, a whole different dimension. It's a very original idea, isn't but it? But there are, there are sort of cliffhanger aspects to the plot because yeah, right. it's, it's a couple who are celebrating their divorce and it's various <laughs> friends who come to the party <laughs> who think that they are immune to such misery in their own relationship. Um, and, uh, and there's a you know, young waiter who's at the party who believes he's a genius artist and he needs to be discovered and this is going to happen at the party. And there's a young woman who wants to get pregnant and has never been able to get pregnant. And, and what happens, and there's a young man who's always spent his life looking for his mother, which sort of has a sort of slight Mozart, you know, Mozart quality to it. Um, but uh, so the cliffhangers are really where uh, each of the characters in the story come into the story with a set of expectations of how the night is going to unfold. And the, and the plot is really about how all their expectations are completely turned on their head. And... Um, everything goes wrong and right um, for the different characters. So in that way, it is quite easy to find the places where, mm, yeah. uh, where you sort of go, is she going to be killed by the gangsters who are about Which to arrive? It just sounds like a miniature ring cycle itself. Yeah. <laughs> Four parts. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. And have you, has the music, have you had any discussions with Elena about the music? Has the music changed in response to this new format? Well, not yet. Actually, the, the big meetings tomorrow. I'm going up to oh. Sydney in the morning um, and we're going to Elena and Simon Phillips who's directing it, who some of you may know, uh, the ex-artistic director of MTC who's directed some of my plays. Uh, Simon's directing it. Um, and so Simon, Lyndon Terracini, who runs Opera Australia, um, uh, Elena and I are all sitting in a room with two actors. And the two actors are going to read the whole opera. They're just going to read it so that we have a sense of the kind of the narrative, um, the cliffhangers, the openings, um, the, the mood of it. Um, and Elena is going to listen to that very carefully. And then, um, you know, we're, we're going to have a conversation about the nature of the music and in, sort of encapsulating what we learn and I just do you mentioned something a bit just to recap um, about the fact that in retrospect you feel like love in the age of therapy was overwritten you used the word overwritten in the context of a libretto what what do you mean by that 
I think I was um, I was thinking too much like a playwright, um, and I was feeling the the kind of burden of responsibility to communicate everything with the audience. Trying to I was trying to control the audience's experience of the work, and I don't think I left enough room for the music to do that because ultimately that is the music's job, and it should be the music's job. And through the course of it, yes, we did make edits in the rehearsals um very hard to edit in rehearsal when something's been composed um, but we did do that as much as we could of course with a play it's easy to make edits you can say let's cut everything from that point on but it's not so easy when you're working in tandem with a composer um, but we did do edits but I think I I was trying to express too much of the emotion in words and um, I didn't need to do that right great thanks and so Brett, this is to my left is um, Brett Dean, and um, Brett's uh, a prolific composer and also a viola player, and he um, he is also a very busy person right at the moment because um, last night he joined with the Soundstream Collective for a concert of new music at the Melbourne Recital Centre, and on this coming Friday, the 26th of July, Brett's cantata for bass, baritone, chorus and orchestra, The Last Days of Socrates, receives uh, its Australian premiere by the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra under the baton of Simone Young. That's where he's off to. And the libretto of this work, which depicts the trial and death of the Greek philosopher, was written by the librettist Graham Ellis. But before we talk a bit about that, Brett, mm. I was wondering, could you just ref talk tell us a little bit about your earlier um, opera, Bliss. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it's been fascinating also hearing about particularly your, your earlier exploits in the, in the genre because it, it also takes me back to the, the whole gestation period for Bliss, which was very long, very complicated, and um, I also felt I learnt an enormous amount um, in the process. Um, by the time I did start work on the libretto, on a finished libretto, it was already the second librettist that I'd been working with on the project. And uh, the first librettist, who shall remain nameless, although the email address is... No. Um, <laughs> <coughs> no. It wasn't um, either of us. I hate to do that. That was, that was a process whereby, I must say, I didn't know enough about how to go about writing an opera at the time where we were sort of embarking on this somewhat blindly together. And um, it was not until I sat down with Neil Armfield, who was then the designated director for the project, and that also you know, took, took its time. Originally, Simone Young was to, to, well, was the initiator for the whole idea. And so you know, a lot of the process towards getting the, the opera started was a bit like an operatic libretto in itself. Um, and, and a tragic one too, because ultimately also Richard Hickox, who was then uh, Simone's successor and was to conduct it, uh, died uh, well before the event as well. So it was, it was a very difficult process. And at times, um, particularly after, after Simone's departure, there were moments where I really didn't think it was ever going to happen. But it was when Richard joined the company and wanted to embrace this idea and make sure that it happened and establish his mark on the company and make sure that the company was also promoting um, new work. And I must say, it's, it's really good, positive to hear that uh, Opera Australia are commissioning this work of yours and mm. Elena's because uh, since Bliss, there hasn't really been anything in the last three or four years, mm. um, even though, you know, that there was promise that that would happen, so I'm I'm really pleased to hear that. But um, it it then got back on track, and Richard brought Neil Armfield into the project. And it was only when I sat down with him that I started to learn about what the libretto was there for, and um, perhaps in a way started to recognise you know a good libretto from a bad libretto, um, and. I don't want to dwell on, on the, the previous work too much, but it was clear that, um, as Neil said, you know, if, if this is the vehicle, then I don't feel I can drive it. And 
it actually chimed in with my own misgivings, but I just didn't trust them enough. Um, I then read a lot of libretti, and it was then reading Amanda Holden's libretto for The Silver Tassie, an opera by the UK composer Mark Anthony Turnage that was produced at ENO in 2000. I read this libretto and thought, oh, I could have set that. I know how that piece would go if I were writing it. I mean, I would have come up with different solutions to the problem to Mark, who's music I, I love, but uh, I would have taken a different take on it. But I, I could see where I would go with it, and it just inspired me. So that was the start of that collaboration, which then in its, in its own way took a year and a half before we had a finished libretto. And we also had this moment where we all sat down in Melbourne. Amanda came out from England, and we sat down with Neil and my daughter Lottie and, the, and Amanda and myself, and we, we read through it. Um, and it was a fantastic sort of week-long process of going through every single word of the piece. And I also remember Neil bringing in, because uh, we're talking obviously about Peter Carey's first novel, an adaptation, adaptation thereof, and it was Neil that then brought a lot of the Australian colour to it that, that Amanda obviously wasn't as well versed with. Yeah. And so, you know, he brought in wonderful words like, you drongo, you dill. <laughs> and and um, it, it sort of spiced up the colour. It was just a very exciting process and it was, it was alive. And, and the, the great thing also was that Amanda... She's uh, translated over 50 operas from other languages into English, mostly for ENO. And, you know, just lives and breathes opera and wrote the famous Penguin Guide to Opera and so on. And she was just so into that idea that that sense of collaboration was palpable in the room that day. And I think that that is very much part of it, that, sure, in the end, as you say, it's, it's the composer driving it, but it has to be a collaboration. And I have heard from fellow composers who have have worked with librettists who really don't want a word to be changed at the end of it. And I, I just don't know how you'd go about no. that. It just wouldn't... Mm. I couldn't couldn't work like that. Well, no, but no work of art works like that. No, I no. mean, you know... And you, least of all the collaborative Least one. of all, yeah, mm. exactly. But I think there's probably quite a big difference in writing a libretto, which is an um, adaptation of something pre-existing yeah. and starting from scratch. I think that, you know, that idea of, as Peter, you were saying, about reducing something to its, its elemental, uh, you know, story uh, architecture um, is, is one thing. Um, it's another thing creating that architecture from the, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably much easier to start with nothing than it is to start with something. Mm. Well, turn, I mean, I'm just thinking about that because another thing, and this is kind of another funny story about Richard, but because um, <laughs> he, he launched a novel of mine called Three Dog Nights, and I'm thinking about the, the problems of reducing a novel, for instance, mm. to uh, which maybe is more, more difficult than a play, which already has a sort of more tighter dramatic structure. Yeah, yeah. And he came over to Adelaide to launch this novel of mine. I invited him to do it, and he gave a great launching speech. And then years later, there was a stage adaptation which was done by Petra Kalaiva, who I think is here tonight and it was done in Melbourne and then later in Adelaide and it was a she just condensed this novel which is a pretty big novel just into three characters and uh, it, you know a very a much simpler and beautifully dramatic form and Richard came to opening night here in Melbourne with us and he came out afterwards and he was stunned he decided he wanted to make an opera of it and I, as he talked I realized he'd never read the novel he'd launched <laughs> 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 anyway, Rich, Rich I mean, I don't mind, but, you know, that's... Or not right through. You know. <laughs> but he loved the play. <laughs> and the play would make a better opera than the novel because it is, I mean, in a sense, you know, I mean, because it's already been reduced to those, you know, what you were talking about before. The big bones. Yeah, the big mm. bones, yeah. Mm. So it certainly seems like there's definitely room for dramaturgy or that uh, that dramaturgical editorial kind of assistance is really helpful in this collaborative process. If you've got that kind of eye um, working on the work, it helps to sort of to clarify structural issues. It's, I mean, you've talked all of you a lot about structure 
It's been really fascinating. Well, I mean, it is theatrical. I mean, it's a, you know, it is a theatrical medium. So, um, you know, dra- dramaturgy is always going to be useful because you're discovering things as it's becoming 3D, you know. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think that... I think that probably the magic happens when that collaboration is is really um, there's you know when there's this particular spark between you um, between the composer and the librettist. So I think you know it would be hard going into that whole uh, process without having a, a sort of a real connection with the person you're working with. I think. Mm. Brett, how has it been working on your latest project, The Last Days of Socrates, with Graham? Yeah, you mentioned you know this, this uh, comparison when we were emailing uh, previously, the comparison between Bliss, for example, with Amanda and um, this new work, Socrates, with Graham William Ellis. And, I mean, the, the two couldn't be more different, at least in the amount of time. It was, it was a very long process with Bliss, as I mentioned, Socrates, um, the, the thing they did have in common was the fact that I'd started work with uh, another librettist on Socrates, who shall also remain nameless. But um, uh, And that, I also felt, wasn't really um, working out as I'd hoped. Um, I then had actually already worked once with Graham. We did a piece for the um, St Thomas's Choir in Leipzig, which was premiered last Christmas Day in, in the St Thomas's Church and Bach's Church in Leipzig, a kind of Christmas cantata. And that had, had been a really joyous affair to work with Graham on that. And so I was actually just talking with him about the fact that we were going to meet in... Um, in Leipzig and we were looking forward to that and I just in passing said by the way do you do you happen to know anything of the Socrates story and the platonic dialogues and so on he said well yes I do as a matter of fact I studied class civ you know classical civilization at uni and I said well look I've got this sort of <laughs> conundrum uh, and we we talked about it we went and had a coffee and as you do in Melbourne and and um the next day, he sent me this fantastic poem, just setting the scene of... of it sort of dealt with the goddess Athena and uh, the, the Socratic idea of the song, the swan's song, and um, I thought, this is remarkable. I mean, he stayed up all night and was just buzzing. And so compared to the, the operatic idea, which obviously, and as you said, it's very difficult to condense a book, uh, the copy uh, of Peter Carey's Bliss that Amanda owned had so many sort of colour-coded <laughs> tabs on, on almost every page, and she'd written an index that was sort of comparable to a very thick, compli- complex non-fiction mm. book of <laughs> medical theory or something, so that every character was you know, indexed with page numbers wow. and so on, so that she had a, a real grip of the whole thing. It was, it was a work of art in itself, um, her book, her copy. And this was the other extreme. This was, was Graham in a fit of inspiration, going home, staying up all night, and, and sort of you know, vomiting this out the next morning in an email, and, and it, she, he just couldn't, couldn't not send it. And I thought, wow, that's extraordinary. And, of course, it took a while from that point, but by a while, I mean maybe a month at most. And in that time, he kind of... He absorbed particularly two parts of the Platonic dialogues, the, the sections, the apology that deals with Socrates' defence when he's standing in front of this Athenian court of, of Melitus and his followers and the, 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 the jury of 500 and so on, and had turned that into this incredibly gripping courtroom drama. And also Phaedo, the, the scene in which Socrates is waiting in the, in the prison cell for them to bring the cup of hemlock. And, um, and then we prefaced it with an adaptation, a further adaptation of this sort of uh, poem that he'd written on the very first night, this, you know, O oh Goddess Athena. Um, and it all just kind of happened uh, in, in a matter of weeks. It was extraordinary. It tells you something about the art form that 
pitching for a job requires you to write a poem and email it. I mean, there can't be any other art form where that's going to get you a gig. <laughs> but you should always trust obsession and passion, yeah. shouldn't you? Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And it had, was the initial librettist assigned to the project by someone else? Well, I had already said in, in the whole commission process from the beginning, I'd said that I wanted to work with a librettist on this and not use an already existing work. And, I mean, you had also asked in your email what the, the differences there are. And I mean, I must say one of the biggest differences, apart from the fact that with an already existing work, uh, in many cases, well, you can't necessarily discuss that work with the author. Either they're dead or it's published and it, and it exists in this form and no other. But also, if, um, if the piece is still protected under copyright, it, it is often really, really complicated. And I have had some very complex uh, copyright issues that my publishers have had to deal with. And in one case... I actually still need to sit down with the widow of an American author to convince her to allow me to have an ongoing uh, permission to use this particular text that I've already set, but we've only ever been able to get a kind of time limit of, of three years at a time to, to have the piece performed. And I think possibly in this particular instance, the widow of the writer in question, this is um, Charles Bukowski's widow, perhaps was um, thinking that, um, that by adaptation, you know, we were talking about a, a film script or something and, and that this was, yeah. you know, potentially a, a money spinner. And, of course, we're talking contemporary <laughs> music, you know. <laughs> It's, it's no money spinner. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're still to have that, that conversation and, and, you know, it'll be, it'll be a great... Oh, it'll be fascinating to, to meet her anyway. But, uh, you know, to sort of be able to explain how that part of the industry actually works. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm wondering, Peter and Joanna, about... Um, the relationship, like how much poetry is in, poetry writing is in writing a libretto and if there's ever an issue about to rhyme or not to rhyme. That is the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I uh, Love in the Age of Therapy, I think, um, was quite poetic in places. Um, but it didn't rhyme. Um, with the divorce, I'm actually, I started quite instinctively to rhyme. Um, and my writing is very, has very strong rhythms in it. My, my, my playwriting has very strong rhythms in it. And actors always say that to me, you know, a week or so into rehearsal, they go, oh my God, this play has got such an, a strong rhythm. Because I always say, in the first week of rehearsals, don't you don't need to act. You just need to say it out loud. And if you say it out loud, it will begin to make sense. Um, if you just let the rhythms assert themselves, and so um, so quite instinctively, I started writing the new opera with Ryan. And uh, but I didn't sort of want to feel like I had to do the whole thing in rhyme. So I then went to Simon Phillips and I just had a sort of very casual conversation with him where I said, look, I'm writing some bits in rhyme, but do you think it needs to be consistent? You know, I'm worried about having to do the whole thing. And he said, not at all. You know, do, do what you feel like in rhyme and then don't rhyme when you don't want to. And so I've taken, I don't know whether it's right or not, it could be completely leading me up the garden path. It wouldn't be the first time. But... Um, um, <laughs> But anyway, that's what I've done. Um, but I've had a lot of fun with the rhymes because rhyming gives you certain comic possibilities, which is sort of hard to explain. But sometimes the oddness of a rhyme makes something funny. You know, the, the weirdness of the word that you use to complete that rhythmic rhyme. So it's, it seems to be working really well with this story, but I'll, I'll know more tomorrow night. Shame we don't have a recap, you know, on Friday, and I can tell you what a disaster it was. I'm starting all over again. He laughs when, yeah. And Peter, do you...? Um, 
I didn't it use much in some of the 17th dial. In um, Batavia, I generally use four stressed uh, or th- sometimes three stressed lines. You can't sing. I mean, that's what I mean. I was using 17th century models anyway, and although you know Milton and Shakespeare, that's generally blank verse is and it's pentameter, but uh, five stressed lines. But um, you can't sing that very well. And the Dutch actually, old Dutch is mostly hexametric, like six, six stresses, but. And I mean Shakespeare himself, if he wants a song, say in the Tempest, it's generally three stresses or four stress lines. And um, but then more, you know, and, and Jonas hit on something there though. This tremendous comic potential, and I mean, whether it's from you know, Byron through to Gilbert and Sullivan through to Tin Pan Alley, those great, those great sort of half rhymes and ridiculous rhymes that we know from like Ira Gershwin. You know, he made his home in that Fisher's Abdomen. That's, that stuff's always all. I'm biding my time because that's the kind of guy I'm. Those, that, but that, that actually all comes out of Byron in, in Don, Don Juan. It's I don't know if you want to go back and see it. So even you know I am the very model of a modern major general. It's in there in Canto Two, I think in uh, of, in Byron. It's, it, I hadn't realised this, and it's just set out there exactly, just about in a slightly different form. It's, uh, the princess of um, wherever she is. Um, so, but those those lines and those rhymes are, are be- make beautiful. But also, rhyme can make quite simple and beautiful poetry as well. Mm. Where you know, a song like "Summertime," just to stick to the Gershwins, is a very beautiful, beautiful, simple song. And um, you can't get too complicated as you might with written poetry in song as a rule. So, I have a theory that with sur- surtitles. It gives you an extra moment or so to digest the written word, but that's probably a librettist prejudice, you know, thinking that we can jump out, you know, jump out of the music for a little while and have a moment of, you know, intellectual um, uh, congruency with our audience uh, apart from the music. That's a sort of a fantasy. So hip hop's doing it. That's what I. Yeah. And you talked. To, oh, no, sorry. No, 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 no. I was just going to say that the, the surtitle thing has has been a game changer in many ways yeah. for for opera, hasn't it? I mean, it's certainly elevated the words to a different uh, level of understanding, particularly yeah. in in terms of uh, you know foreign language operas. Um, and it's only then that you really realise how funny the Mozart operas are, yeah. for example. Yeah. Mm. And and then you realise what role humour has mm. p- plays in almost all well, of them. banal some of the Italian operas. Eh? Yeah, well, that, <laughs> that, that too. too. That too. But, but if, uh, you know, no, Da Ponte I think, is a great librettist, and uh, you do mm. see that in. Uh, yeah. But it also brings greater scrutiny then of the of the libretto. You know, yeah. I mean, I remember going to operas as a kid, and, and it all sort of passed passed me by. I, I enjoyed the experience. I couldn't quite fathom it, but mm. I didn't understand one single word. But you know, now people can go to an opera without necessarily any prior knowledge or, or mm. investment in it and, and enjoy it like a foreign language film. Mm. Even when it's sung in English, you still need the, the subtitles. Well, a lot the other thing is that the libretto can play another function where uh, certainly a, a kind of a, a more kind of egalitarian function I guess in a, in a highfalutin art form um, mm. where it can you know uh, it can uh, reduce that sense of opera being elevated and and removed and I think that probably with contemporary operas that's that there is more of a uh, role for the libretto to do that, you know, to, I mean, that's obviously why Opera Australia want this to be a television opera, is that mm. they and certainly when we wrote Love in the Age of Therapy, um, I felt and Paul felt, we all felt, the opera did as well, that um, Paul's music was quite uh, difficult um, to, to, for, uh, for not non sort of musical aficionados it was a really new sound I mean I thought incredibly brilliant um, and and uh, incredibly interesting and complex but uh, you did have to listen to it it, it was quite uh, intellectually engaging and quite uh, demanding on the audience. And so the idea we had was that we would put together this very sophisticated music, um, which is, you know, bringing jazz into opera and all sorts of other things, um, with a, an incredibly accessible story and incredibly accessible uh, characters. So my libretto was sort of Woody Allen-ish, I guess, in its feel. And uh, Paul's music was quite um, esoteric. And so that was the libretto had that 
function really of drawing the audience into something that they might feel at least in the beginning um, quite distant to that was the way in to the music was and it I, was it surtitled it was surtitled yes it was surtitled and I think that helped um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that was sort of an interesting idea that the opera had um, in that regard because you could feel in the experience of watching the opera, I felt, and, you know, who knows, not necessarily the best judge, but I felt as if you could feel the audience. As soon as the audience reached the point where they felt invested in the story, they started relaxing into the music. They started not worrying there was a sort of anxiety about the music to begin with. You know, this isn't music you can whistle, this isn't, I can't hum this. And then gradually, as they got more involved in the characters and the story, they began to almost physically relax. Um, and then by the end, you know, were really incredibly enthusiastic about the music. Mm. So it's a problem though, isn't it? That, I mean, we face that as composers, this... this um, level of of understanding of of modern vernaculars in music seems to always demand a disclaimer i mean you hear it also on the radio you know this this is a modern piece but it's only 10 minutes long so you kind of cope with it and, you know you're already sort of setting up this distancing i think you know and there is this expectation there and it drives me bananas frankly because i mean it's only music it's not going to kill you you know it, and and what's more a lot of those sounds i'm sure also in paul's piece and i, I you know i've got huge respect for paul and i'd love to get to know the work um, and I, I just kind of think a lot of the sounds that, that they, we're going to hear in a modern opera, you know, you would have heard much more extreme things on, on the latest episode of Breaking Bad, you know. <laughs> um, you know we, Which we were talking about backstage. It's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, there's this kind of reticence to kind of accept that that it's but not going to hurt you all. No, but or it, that you can understand it. And uh, some, sometimes I'm bemused by the, the comment of, oh, I kind of understood that piece. And uh, I think understanding a piece of music is, is very much subjective anyway. I mean, you, people understand pieces of music or, or indeed any art form on, on all sorts of different levels. And but do you think that if uh, someone was listening to The Marriage of Figaro for the first time, they would find it more accessible than listening to Bliss for the first time? Oh, undoubtedly. I, I'm yeah. not doubting that. And I, I, I realise that... Uh, but I, I think you're absolutely right, though. The stronger uh, and more that an audience can identify with a story, mm. the more they're just going to go with it yeah. wherever it goes. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. I, I just find it a shame that we always feel, as composers, that you know we have to somehow justify and drag people along with us, which, which mm. is frustrating. Peter, how's the reception been for your latest work, the ringtone cycle? Oh, well, once again, it's a comic piece with, with elements of tragedy or pathos or perhaps pathos, you know, in it. And, and uh, but it was great fun, and uh, it was actually commissioned by my daughter, so sort of nepotistic, for her piano trio originally. And uh, 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 Gabriella Smart did the was in the trio for the um, for the because Anna was yeah. away somewhere and. Uh, and a very good New Zealand uh, soprano, Lisa Harper Brown, and um, and an iPhone. <laughs> and uh, but it, it was it crosses the genres. You know, there's a bit of everything in it. From um, there's a classical few. It's, look, it starts with the phone goes off in the audience, and the musicians play a, a fugue on that Nokia theme. And um, <laughs> but then it has Broadway and it has hip hop. It, uh, it's really a story of an internet date, Brunhilde, trying to get an internet date, and uh, <laughs> she, some pretty horrible characters, you know, <laughs> want to see her photo. Hello, <laughs> Moto, please send photo. But um, so that's uh, it. Is, it's, uh, it was great fun, and. Uh, we hope during the kind of the fake ring cycle here that people will come and see the real one. You know, the ring, the ring. No, no, it'll be a little alternate uh, sidebar to the big event, but it may be, you know, maybe you know, a bit of light entertainment in between. It reminds me of the, the Shane Warne musical and that aria, Oh, what an SMS I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this, this one in that, in that musical is this one a bit of lyric I wish I'd written, and it's um, sex is the best thing, but the next best is texting. <laughs> That's a great couplet. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, uh, we're nearly, yes, we've got time, I think, for a couple of questions if anyone has some burning things they'd like to ask our illustrious panel. Hi, it's Marianne. Um, I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about the simplification of the profound because as someone that works in the industry, I do understand what you're talking about. And I think that an audience that doesn't work in the industry of the arts does understand it when they feel it. But it actually is a statement that when you don't know what that means as a process um, is, is mysterious. And as a little subset question to that, I think that sub surtitles, sorry, um, can sometimes go astray. I saw The Navigator a couple of years ago, or maybe three years ago, and I thought that the surtitles in that were about a, a libretto that was being quite profound, but when it was put up as text, it became really banal. So there was something there, a question for me about what is the role of this, and this is my second question. How can surtitles become an element in their own right? Because it seems to me they need to be, and they can really fail in, in an opera, opera or succeed. They can be a distraction, or they can be an explanation, or they can be another element. So one is, a, my question is about the profound into the simple, but then also what's the role of surtitles in that? Well, if I can come, Marianne, to the, the question of surtitles, because we touched on it mo uh, a moment ago. Um, surtitles have, as I said, broader scrutiny of, of the libretto. Um, but of course, the, the trouble with them is that you can't escape them either. Um, there are a couple of, of places, uh, well, one is the comic opera in Berlin, now run by Barry Kosky, um, which has little screens on the back of each seat and you can choose to have one of four languages with the surtitles um, or just have them turned off completely. Um, and I think that's a, that's a wonderful solution because um, they're discreet. You can sort of glance at them without sort of having to, you know, I mean, it's still sort of not in line with the stage, but it's less, you know, less obtrusive. And of course, above all, you can choose to observe them or not. Um, and I, you know, I agree that sometimes when when the libretto is there in big letters above, you know, the action on the stage, it can it can take on a significance that it perhaps in the in the creation of the piece doesn't have or wasn't meant to have quite like that. You know, I, I don't know what you how you feel about surtitles actually. When you see your words up there, uh, Peter, you mentioned earlier, sort of gives you this sense of worth or value oh, no, in the equation. But it, I, it, I think ideally it's a bit like I remember the first time I ever saw a French movie, which was the first foreign language movie I'd seen when I was about sixteen or seventeen. When I realised it was in French, I almost left, but <laughs> I stayed, and the surtitles, the subtitles came up and. Within a minute or two, that magical thing happened where you heard the actors speaking in English. Mm. And uh, there is that, the mind does some uh, reconnection. And I think ideally that's what happens, obviously that's the, uh, the ideal that happens with uh, Sir Tyler's in opera, that um, it doesn't get in the way, that it's, it's, it's transparent glass somehow and um, it's not getting in your way of you. And you know, that's, I think as a British, you have to accept that finally, that it's still an adjunct, even if we want people to absorb more, a little bit more from re being able to read the words. But finally, no, it has to be... The, the music, can, and music can tell us the story by itself, as we know. Music has tremendous narrative power. And so they have there's, there's some ideal state where they're working together. I don't know, that's perhaps not answering it. But the, the, there is a, there's, I think there's a level of complexity beyond which, um, you know, a libretto can't go or it's going to slow things down. And you, you slow this down and you're starting to think about it. So the, there has to be that beautiful, that great simple poetry there somewhere. I, I love some, I love surtitles because I don't want anybody to miss a single word. <laughs> <laughs> so Me too, secretly, that, but exactly. I'm glad you said that. I couldn't admit it. Do you think they'll have them on the television? Oh, that's an interesting question. Mm. I, I will ask that tomorrow and report back. But um, 
I suspect that if you are close enough to the... I think probably the intimacy of a camera on a face means that they m might not be necessary. You know, it's the, the, it's the distance to the stage in, the, in big auditoriums that really, I think, is a huge issue in terms of being able to understand what people are, are singing. So I think if you're up close to a face um, and you can read the expression um, on the face, um, you probably don't need them. A quick observation. Schalburn Berlin, who came here with uh, Hedda Gabler, had surtitles, subtitles, and side titles. So it was quite interesting. You could keep your face to the front and just at the periphery pick up the words. Mm -hmm. They became that uh, yeah. distorted neck routine. <laughs> yeah. Question, if I may. When you're, when you're writing a piece, how do you know whether you're writing a solo aria, a duet, duet a chorus, or a recitative? Is it a difficult uh, decision? Did everyone hear that question? Because it's a very good question. Peter, you touched on aspects of working on Batavia and working out with Richard where the big moments were and so on. And that, that sort of probably touched on it a bit. I yeah, we, we went into that week-long meeting and I'd already sketched out a, um, a dramatic structure and uh, where, where I thought the action would be happening in terms of that kind of exchange and uh, Richard came in and we went through it together and he had a few other ideas and they seemed quite logical to me. I, look, I actually think that's... Um, when you, uh, It's pr probably rather similar to writing a play, Joanna, that uh, I, th I think... As you, as you do it, maybe not this first draft, but the second, third, fourth draft, it becomes clear who should be saying what. It can take time, and uh, it can be, you know, when you're going back later. But I think it's, it's not... It, yes, I think that's true, but I think it's a little bit different because in a play, everyone is speaking... Uh, yes, you have to work out who's saying what, but everyone is speaking only by themselves when they speak. And um, what I found was that I started to write the opera a bit like that, like a play, and then Elena would say to me, um, I think it's time for more voices. You know, this is actually, a, we're actually missing a combination of voices in this moment. And I'd go, oh, okay, oh, I need mm. to rethink that moment as a, as a song, you know, where there is a unified expression rather than an indivi individual expression. Um, but I, I was really, in terms of knowing when to do what, I, I've really been taking my um, brief from Elena, you know, that she, she will say to me, it's too long since we've heard more than one voice. Quite straightforward. Would it be true that you, like me, don't naturally think about choruses, though? Well, which is one big thing that Richard did bring in, because I wouldn't... Yeah. I'd be thinking more, perhaps, um, as a prose writer, just in individual voices, having exchanges, rather mm. than a chorus. A chorus wouldn't occur to a novelist. You know, you're not going to have, or a poet, yeah. necessarily, I think. <clears throat> That's probably one big difference, mm. perhaps, that well, where you do uh, depend on the composer. To and one of the lovely things is you can have a song, like for instance in, my, in The Divorce, you can have a song that's happening in, within the party where uh, all, you know, where say six characters are singing at the same time, but structurally within the narrative you can make them ex be expressing those words for different reasons. You know, with a different, with a with a different motive, because they're coming from their own individual perspectives. So there is a unified, there is it, there is unity in terms of the actual language, but there are very different meanings within that one song for all of the different characters. Mm. How fun! It is fun. Yeah. yeah. And of course, when you bring chorus into it, it's got to be a, it's got to be plausible that all of mm. a sudden. There's some reason that many voices have, uh, are chiming in. I mean, one of the great you know, mob operas is Peter Grimes, you know, and this sense of one against many is, is palpable because of the way he uses the chorus. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I, I do think one of the, the great things about Graham Ellis's uh, libretto for Socrates is the way that he's, he's turned... The, the apology of Plato is... is bit of a diatribe of Socrates sort of stating his case and there's not much there in, in terms of the, the mob but he has really brought this mob to life 
And with that, I actually have to go and yes. hear the mob. But <laughs> it, it's been a great pleasure. Nice so, pleasure yes, we've reached our time. Yeah. So um, thank you very much. For, and thank you very much. Thanks, so, uh, yeah. really